I saw this at a Giants game recently. This came up on the screen. How about that? That's a lot of fun, isn't it? Everybody cheered. Everybody thought that was a grand old time to celebrate that. I could not believe that that came up on the screen. In California, the divorce rate is nearing the 60% mark. Marital faction for the first time in history is starting to dip below 50%. And the never marry culture is exploding in California, which is how we get to happy divorce. My daughter's starting to write all of her college entrance essays, and they're, they're, one of the things that they want to know is tell us about a hard season of your life where you had to overcome, where things are hard. And, one of the, and they say, here are a couple things that are off limits because we're tired of hearing about them. And you know what one of them was? Your parents' divorce. Like, that doesn't distinguish you in any way. Almost 60% of kids in California, you need to find a different subject to write about. Everybody has to overcome that now. So it may be happy divorce for Max, but I wonder how his kids feel because they're still getting flooded with college entrance essays where it's a difficult, awful thing that they had to overcome. So much so that colleges are saying, stop writing about it. So right now, we're going to put in a little work today. Because last week when I said that marriage is either a contract or covenant, well, those two worldviews come into play this morning. Because when, 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 when you get into seasons of sickness or when things are not as healthy as they should be, whether it's physically, whether it's relationally, or whether you're just growing old together and your appearances are changing and your values are changing and the things you want are changing, when those things start to happen, you're either going to see that season, contract view wants out, Covenant view wants through. Now, how exactly do we get through when a marriage is not as healthy as we'd like it to be? When, especially when things don't seem to be getting better and when you're maybe you're stuck in the crazy cycle. Remember this graphic from last week? We said that there are three cycles of marriage and the hardest one is the crazy cycle where everything is about reciprocity. If you don't love me, I'm not going to respect you. And if you don't respect me, I'm not going to love you. And round and round and round you go. How do you get through seasons that are like this? Well, two things, first of all, that I would like to say before we really get into it. Number one, there is a lot of grace for failed marriages, even the ones that are in this room. Listen, last week I talked till death do us part. Maybe what I forgot to say last week is for some of you who are in your second marriage or somehow that marriage, you know, was hijacked by something else maybe adultery, maybe you were feeling like you didn't fulfill your vow. And I want you to know that because of His vow to you, His covenant to you in Jesus Christ, that there is a lot of grace. Not grace that should be abused and used as an excuse for, not, for quitting on your marriage, but for those of you who are on the other side of a hard marriage or a failed marriage, you need to know that there's a lot of grace for you. Grace upon grace. So there's grace for failed marriages and there's hope for hard marriages. See, marriage, I said last week, is about joy, not just holiness. But what we settle for, particularly in, in, in certain seasons of life, is just for it to not be hard. And when you take on the mentality of, I just don't want it to be hard, then what you do is you don't talk about any hard things. Gentlemen, you come home at the end of the day and you basically wear this, you wear this mantle. Don't talk to me about anything hard because I've been working hard at work all day. 
You can't. You can't. I know, I've done it. You know why you can't do that? Because healthy marriages come through the hard. The hard is part of it. It is necessary. It's why we made the vows on our wedding day in the first place. We need to know what a marriage is about during hard seasons and what it is not. So for that, let's turn to our text in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25. I'm just going to read the second half of that verse. And it reads as follows. It says, Christ loved the church and gave Himself up for her. Now remember, last week I said that the primary purpose of marriage this side of Eden is to be a metaphor for the Gospel of Jesus Christ. And so what Paul is highlighting here is that a hallmark of your marriage ought to be sacrifice, ought to be sanctification, ought to be a a view of marriage with the end in mind. And, And it just so happens that my three points this morning have a lot to do with those three things. So let's start. Marriage is about is not about compromise. It's about service. Now, this may sound antithetical to everything you know about marriage. Maybe you've read some marriage books, or you've been to a Christian marriage conference, or you've heard a pastor like me get up here and say that marriage is is about a lot of compromise. Well, that's part of the problem. Because compromise is only a short-term solution. Now, what do I mean by that? Compromise, think about what compromise is. It's both of you saying, I'm not going to do what I want. (laughs) So uh, that's not really that much fun. Do you know what I'm saying? There's not a lot of joy in in a lifetime of going, I'm only going to kind of get what I want. It's just a short-term Compromise is about mutual loss. Is that enough to sustain a marriage? Now, I'm not saying there's not a time and a place for compromise. Sometimes it is a nece- there needs to be a necessary, mutual, short-term solution until we can examine ourselves. The Bible doesn't recognize the idea of compromise very much. In fact, the closest that I could get to it is when it talks about, you know, intimacy issues, and it comes up in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, and it says this, do not deprive one another, except perhaps by agreement for a limited time. So that word agreement is probably as close as we can get to compromise for a limited time, meaning it's a short-term solution so that you can focus on what's going on inside of you, so that you can examine yourself by devoting yourselves to prayer, but then you need to come back together again because too much compromise for too long without self-examination and prayer is a foothold and stronghold for Satan. Sounds controversial, doesn't it? Marriage cannot be sustained on mutual loss. In other words, Paul's saying that's too much opportunity for Satan. A lifetime of that creates bitterness. Now, when I say the Bible doesn't really endorse the idea of compromise, I mean our Western idea of compromise. Because when we hear the word compromise, what we hear is settling. And compromise, if it's a short-term solution, settling isn't going to work. Now, the word compromise is fascinating because it's, it comes from a Latin. It comes from Latin and French words that mean this: "com," which means what? Together or with. And the French word for promise. It means the word compromise means coming together to make a promise, to make a vow, a mutual vow. Does that sound like how we use that word? No. 
it sounds like I'm not going to get to watch football today. That's what it sounds like, right? That's what that word sounds like, okay? But it's an, it's an amalgamation of the word together and to promise. And, and it compromises a short-term solution. But the idea of compromise in its entomology and in its biblical framework is this. Service. So the Bible doesn't recognize compromise. It's constantly calling married couples into a life of service. Because service, whereas compromise is a short-term solution, service is a lifetime privilege. Now let me tell you what service is not. Service is not losing. A life of service to the person that you are in covenant relationship with is not losing all the time. 1 Corinthians 7, verse 4. It's not going to be on the screen, but verse 4, uh, a guy named Eugene Peterson in his kind of commentary summary called The Message basically summarizes this verse this way. It's one of my favorite ways to summarize this verse. He says, Marriage is not a place to stand up for your rights. Marriage is a decision to serve. And then it, Paul in Romans 12 says, Love one another outdo one another in showing love. He pictures a kind of relationship with one another where we're outdoing one another in love and service. Where we're trying to one-up each other in love and service. He's trying to say to us that that's where the real joy in marriage comes from. I want to make sure you have what you need and the other person's going, I want to... He's theorizing that if two people come together and they try and outdo one another in service, you will always both have your needs met. But the secular Western way is we fight for what we need rather than we give what they need. Service is not losing. It's not about like giving up things. It's not about saying this. Is, it, it's about choosing something better. My... Um, well, let me, let me say this first. Service is also not martyring. You're not like dying for a cause, you know, where you don't have any life, where you're, you're like, ah, I'm not, really, I don't really, I'm not really living my best life because I got to die for this cause, which is my wife. And it's like, whoa, put that on a greeting card. Happy Valentine's Day, honey. I'm dying for a cause, but not really living. That's what martyrdom is, right? Ephesians says this, in the same way husbands should love their wives as their own bodies, he who loves his wife loves himself. No one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. In other words, he's saying that the one fleshness of marriage, when you love your spouse, you're really loving yourself. Paul is tapping into our self-interest in this moment and saying, there's an old saying that goes like this, happy wife, happy life. What's kind of biblically true? <laughs> There's biblical evidence for this way of thinking. But it goes both ways. That the real joy is in seeing the person that I am in covenant relationship with flourish. That is a much better joy. So I can, I, I, I can come home early today. I can talk about the hard things today. I can help out today. I can do the cooking today. Or I can, whatever it is. We can go to your restaurant today. Service is not losing. It's not martyring, but it is sacrificing. And men, you're going to do more of it than she does. 1 Peter 3.7 says this, Husbands, 
live with your wives in an understanding way. Now, I, I don't think that this just means, you know, biblical understanding, gospel understanding. Short, those are good things and ambitions that we need to assimilate into our thinking as men and as lovers of our wives and servers of our wives. But I also think understanding her, knowing her, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, not relationally, not emotionally, not uh, practically speaking, surely physically is what Paul means here, since they are heirs with you to the grace of life. Heirs, co-heirs in some translations. The idea meaning is, 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 is you're both children of God equally and you're both saved equally, but you husbands are called to metaphor the Christ-like sacrifice that the Gospel has embedded into its narrative. So you're, you're going to have to die to your personality, die to your desires, die to the things that you want. Sacrifice these things so that she can live. That's the Gospel. So number one, marriage is not about compromise. It's about service. And number two, marriage is not about satisfied. It's about sanctified. Verse 26. So he says, uh, He gave Himself up for her, the bride, that's us, the church. Verse 26, that He might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of the Word. I wish that said His Word. Uh, satisfaction does not sanctify us, but sanctification does satisfy us. A guy, named, a guy named Henny Youngman wrote this. Some people ask the secret of our long marriage. Now, Henny Youngman is a comedian from the like the 50s and 60s and he says we take some time to go to a restaurant two times a week a little candlelight dinner soft music and dancing she goes tuesdays i go fridays it's funny it's a little sad right you've heard this statement it works for us When I do marriage counseling, there is no phrase I hate hearing more. It works for us. My daughter has a VW bug and it was leaking oil when we first got it. And so I took it to a mechanic and the first mechanic that saw it said, yeah, you're going to have to replace this entire oil pan. And the way that VW makes their cars is you've got to actually take out this entire unit. So it's like a $3,000 job. So I was like, well, I'll be getting a second opinion and uh, just, for, just for fun. And so then I took it to this other place that specializes in VWs. And he's like, he's like yeah, that's typically what you got to do. But there's kind, of a, there's kind of a workaround. And I was like, tell me more about this workaround and what does it cost? Uh, and he says, well, instead of $3,000, I, I can probably get it to stop leaking for, you know, about $100. What exactly are you going to do? He's like, do you really want to know? I was like, no, I don't. Carry on. And so he did, the, he did some work around. I still don't know. It's never leaked again since. It has worked fine. It has worked great. I have no idea what he did. He, but here's the deal. He bypassed a problem in a way that that car still functions as if there's no problem, which is what some of you are doing in your marriages sometimes. You are bypassing some problems because it works for you to the neglect of some serious problems. And you've even learned to bypass it in such a way that the marriage still mostly functions. You're satisfied with how things are. Just like I'm satisfied with whatever he did to that Volkswagen. But satisfaction doesn't change us. It doesn't sanctify us. It doesn't bring the fullness of joy that God has designed your marriage to have. Because meanwhile, 
even though it works for you, somewhere in the back of your head, and somewhere deep in your heart, you know there are some things that you have bypassed. So satisfaction isn't going to sanctify you, meaning it isn't going to change you, but sanctification does satisfy you. Now, let's talk about sanctification for a second. What is sanctification? First Thessalonians says this, it's His will for you, for this is the will of God, your sanctification. So when you're asking yourself, I wonder what the will of God for me today is. You ready? To be sanctified. To be changed. To mature. To grow. To become more like Jesus. So what did you do today to grow more? It's His will for you. We know that with 100% certainty. The word sanctification is related to the word saint. Now, both words have to do with holiness. To sanctify something just means to set it aside for special use or holiness. So to understand sanctification, I'm going to put up a slide that shows kind of the three stages, phases, processes of the gospel of Jesus Christ for believers. The first thing that happened to you was your justification. Okay? Your justification is that you have been separated from sin's penalty. Jesus lived the life that you couldn't live. He died the death that you should have died and imputed to you His righteousness. You imputed to Him your sinfulness. It's called the great exchange. And the penalty of sin... The sting of death is removed at that moment where you, where you have place your faith in Christ as a sufficient sacrifice and substitute on your behalf. That's called your justification. But the gospel doesn't stop there. As soon as you are justified, you start entering into sanctification. Now, technically, sanctification includes all three of these stages, but that's another conversation. So as soon as you've been justified, you become sanctified, which is now God has separated you from sin's penalty, but now He begins separating you from sin's power over the course of a lifetime. It's hold on you. It's effects on you. We are growing. We are changing. And one of the ways that He sanctifies people is through marriage. And then in the end, one day, the great hope is our glorification in the future, which is we're not just separated from sin's penalty. We're not just being separated from its power. But one day, at long last, we will be carried over the wedding threshold and separated from the very presence of sin ever again. No death, no pain, no relationships to work on. We return to the new Eden in permanent glory and joy. Isn't that good news? Now, satisfaction doesn't change us, but change does satisfy us. When we know our marriage is growing in the Gospel, we grow in affection in our marriage. You heard me say this last week. As a young man, I didn't linger over my wife's presence. Our marriage was much more utilitarian in the early stages of our marriage. Now, like wine, I linger. She walks into a room and catches me staring at her. She's almost off-put by it. What did I do? <laughs> Nothing. Just looking at you. Why? What do you want? Nothing. I'm just glad you're in the room. 
Well, I'm not making this up. I think I hopefully you've been at this church long enough to know I'm just I, I'm not going to blow smoke. That I'm not making this up. We still got our problems. We still got more sanctification. But when we become sanctified, we take more delight in the other person because my wife is now serving me more than she used to when we were younger. I now serve her much more than we used to when we were younger. And so we just delight in each other. In fact, James says this, count it joy... When you meet the trials in your marriage of various kinds, because it's going to produce things in you. that He's describing sanctification in the successions of verses that follows. What if this hard season is redemptive? And you're just trying to get around it. What if this hard season is actually allowed by God's design to help your marriage flourish and you're just trying to bypass it. You can't be sanctified without hard and without sanctification, your marriage can't grow and when your marriage doesn't grow, neither does your affection. All right, so number one, Marriage is not about compromise, it's about service. Number two, marriage is not about being satisfied, but about being sanctified. And number three, lastly, marriage is not about the beginning, it's about the end. Verse 27. So, so let me, he gave himself up for her, he sanctified her, and then he wants to present the church to himself in splendor without any spot or wrinkle or such thing that she might be holy and without blemish. And husbands, you need to do the same. That's what verse 28 says. In other words, he's saying the, the reason I gave myself up for her is so that I could sanctify her and that that sanctification serves the eschatological, the end purpose of presenting her in the full glory that I had promised. That's what He does for us, church. The work that He begins... Don't you love that verse? He who began a good work in you will bring it to completion because His eyes for you are on the end. That the last day is the best day. Not the first day. He wants you to shift your thinking in your marriage to the last day. Not the first day. Because when you're thinking about the first day, you're always going, man, it's, the romance isn't the same as it was. The affection isn't the same as it was. We don't have as much fun as it was. We don't do the things we used to do. But none of that stuff needs to be decisive with respect to the affection that you feel for one another. So Paul says here, get your eyes on the last day the way that Jesus does with His church. Two things about this. Number one, we love the promise of heavily, happily ever after, but do we love the process of happily ever after? Happily ever after is a Disney promise. And it, we all know it's not real. And yet we ascribe to it every single day. This is why we love to start new things or avoid new things because we want happily ever after. We avoid new things because I'm kind, I, I kind of like where I'm at right now, so I'm not willing to do new things. Or we, don't start new, or we do start new things all the time because this is not getting me happily ever after. And we've now applied that think that we started applying that thinking to our culture. Then we started applying it to our vocations where pensions went down and tenure went down. Now we've actually started to apply it to marriage.
Going back to last week, we love the vows because they idealize how we get to happily ever after. But when we actually get into the trenches and have to roll up our sleeves, we start to <laughs> abhor, despise the process of actually getting there. And so I'm going to end with this idea. And it, if you're not a note taker, this is the one and only time I'm going to say you really should. It is time for some of us to start reverse engineering our marriages and getting our eyes on the last day. Now, what do I mean by reverse engineering? Some of you have heard this from me before in the past. Philippians 3.14 says this, I press on looking ahead towards the goal. That word goal is skopos. It means the end in view for the prize of the upward call in Christ Jesus. Now, a guy named Wayne Cordero wrote a book that was really helpful to me on my first sabbatical uh, way back in 2012, and uh, almost 10 years ago now. Uh, and he wrote, and in this, he said there are four ways to live. And I'm going to amend his chapter on this for our purposes this morning to say that there are four ways to think of your marriage. Okay, so look at the chart on the screen. Number one, reactionary. That's option one. If you're taking a reactionary approach to your marriage, it means that you are being passively dominated by urgencies and people. You're allowing your work to dictate what's happening in your marriage. You're allowing pushy people in your life to dictate what's going on in your marriage. You're allowing, you are just being passive with respect to how you handle your marriage. The result is that life is a frazzled mess. It's disorganized. There are no sense of priorities in your relationship. There are half-finished tasks. You're always running late as a couple. And there's a frantic lifestyle. So that's option one. You can just react to life together. Option two. Or that comes from Ephesians 14 actually gives us a, a picture of this so that we may no longer be tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by the wind of every doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness in deceitful skims. So Paul does not want us to be reactionary as Christians. Option two, conformity. You can have a, conform, a conformist's orientation to your marriage. What I mean by this is that you are succumbing to the fear of people and just being and doing what everyone else wants, which is not necessarily following God's will for you or your family. The results of just having a conformist's orientation to your marriage is that there's a boring life where everyone but God and each other is pleased. And the person who is easily pushed around keeps busy and is productive but is not passionate and is not free. We see this in Romans 12 too. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, testing what the will of God is. He doesn't want you to just be a conformist. Number three. Option three is you can handle your marriage independently. What I mean by this is now you're, you're, you're a nonconformist, but you're so much of a nonconformist, you're rebellious. You are in rebellion in the name of freedom, marked by doing only what you want and ignoring godly authority over you and the results in your life of defiance, independence, immaturity, self-reliance, and foolishness. Your wife's at home, she needs help, you're on a golf course. Your husband's trying to do something in his life and you don't think it's important and so you just act. There's this despisal that comes from you. Isaiah 30 says, oh, you stubborn children who carry out a plan, but it's not my plan not of my spirit, and in doing so you add to sin. So he doesn't want you to be living independently. 
Ideally, you would live intentionally in your marriage. That's option four. Option four is intentional. That you reverse engineer your life, that you live it prayerfully and purposefully. Maybe it means journaling your thoughts throughout the day. Maybe it means using silence and solitude to hear from God and organizing your life. The results of living this way in and through your marriage is that it is purposeful, it is passionate to God's glory for people's good and for your joy. Isn't that what we want? Proverbs 29.18 says this, when there's no vision, things die. So let me define reverse engineering. Rather than merely surviving moment to moment, marriage should be shaped by God's vision, which then becomes your vision of what you want to become. And this process of reverse engineering helps you know your priorities, envision your future life built around these priorities, and then you know exactly what changes need to happen in your marriage. I, I, have, I own two devotionals. One is a Spurgeon devotional, and I write my notes in the devotional every morning, but I also write a letter to my son every morning in this devotional. One day, I will close it, and I will hand it to him on his wedding day. And he will have three people's thoughts on how to have a vision for your life in this world. You will have mine. You will have Spurgeon's. But more importantly, he will have the Lord's. I have a second devotional by Oswald Chambers. And I do that devotion after I do the first one. And in that one, I write a letter to my daughter. And I will do the same for her one day. Intentionality doesn't take a lot of time. It just requires intentionality. I have a note on my phone. It just says Shannon. Because I don't pay attention really well. I don't know if you know this about me, okay? I miss things a lot. And there are things that my wife loves and likes, and she's not going to come right out and say them to me. That's not what she's like. But I'll notice it. And I'll write it in the note. And when I started keeping this note, I said to her one day, you know, where do you want to go for dinner? And she goes, me? Well, you want to go to Thai food? I'm like, Thai food? No, no Thai food's fine. Thai, Thai food's fine. I mean, I'm, I'm a Mexican from East LA, but you know, Thai food's fine. That's all right. I can, I can do Thai food. Uh, I, I'm not a fan of Thai food. She loves Thai food. And I got a whole list of little things that she loves. Because the last day is more important than the first day. My priorities for my marriage, I'm going to read to you from my journal, and maybe it's helpful, maybe it makes you mad, I don't know. I want her to remember that I loved one woman, because she deserves that kind of security and faithfulness. I want her to remember me being fully present because she deserves a currency that won't pass away. I want her to remember my best pastoral ministry went to my family, not to my church, because she deserves to never have to make excuses for picking up my slack in my home. I want her to remember mystery and unpredictability because she deserves more than stale or stagnant. I want her to remember that each season got better because she deserves to always have something to look forward to and to never have to say our best years are behind us. And I want her to remember that Jesus is the reason for all of this 
because she deserves perfection and I cannot give that to her. But He can. John Wooden is the undisputed best college basketball coach of all time. He coached UCLA forever. And he always used to say that the hardest part of coaching UCLA's basketball team was making cuts. But he also would say it was the hardest part. And the reason that making cuts was so hard is because you always play the what if game. What if I'm giving up a great player or a star player? What if I'm giving up something like that? And that happens sometimes. But he knew that the cuts were the most important part of every season because that he always knew what they needed and how to win. And he needed to cut out everything else that was going to be a distraction or wasn't going to fit into what he needed. Your marriage is kind of like that. you got to know where you're going so that you know what things need to get cut out of your life. Otherwise, you're going to be playing this game all the time. I can't cut that out. What if that's awesome? What if that pans out? What if that turns out? But what if it hijacks your marriage? Coach Wooden had his eyes on something more than his acclaim. And he's still living like the last day is the most important day, but not with regards to basketball. Coach Wooden has since gone on to be with the Lord, a man of faith, though it doesn't come out very much in that documentary. And maybe things aren't healthy or as healthy as you thought right now in your own marriage. Or maybe that season is still up ahead of the road a little while. Hebrews 10 says that we need to hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for He who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day drawing near. The last day. The best day. If you want to make it through in sickness and in health, church, then you need to have the last day in mind the way Jesus did, who made us a priority by coming and living, taking on the form of flesh. He had the last day of mind by envisioning our future, so He climbed living a sinless life for us. With the last day in mind, Jesus identified at many points temptation and struggle, but in spite of His humanity, He climbed onto a cross, died in our place, rose in victory, securing the future that He imagined for us. As for your marriage, it's really up to you and your spouse today. The first day is fun, but the last day, Last day is the best day. So as Paul would say, look into the future, look into the distance, remember your vows, and finish well.